Okay. We're okay. We're going to access uh, uh, these uh, webcasts. Uh, just shoot me an email and I'll send you the link because it's uh, even though the uh, GoDaddy is has has taken over my website because software constantly updating software, so they are in control of it. So they may like to see my old website. Okay, so let's let's move on. Okay, this fiction piece that we're studying today is uh, it's called Bread, and it's also called Flash fiction. Flash fiction is a genre of fiction that is not well known. Uh, we all know the Hemingways. We all know the great writers, uh, Hawthorns, uh, American literature, Edgar Allan Poe's, Poe's, and they've written longer stories. But there are dedicated writers who write very short pieces. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. And next week, I have a surprise for you uh, at the end of the session. I'll introduce it if we have time. But we're going to next next month, it should be. We're meeting in next month. Okay, so uh, the fiction piece is by Margaret, Margaret Atwood. She was born in 1939 in Ottawa, Canada. And she grew up in northern Ontario, Quebec. She is a Canadian poet, a novelist, a literary critic, an essayist teacher, environmental activist, and an inventor. She invented what's called the long pen device that aids in the growth of the body. Okay. Now, this, because uh, I can't get it. You print that. This to the to the piece. You don't let, let me know. You should be looking at it. Um, it's very, it, it's all on one, it's, it's very compact, it's on one page, and I'm holding it up, this is what it looks like, um, and so it's easy for us to scan it together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gonna... Okay. <laughs> there you go. I tried to get it online, and I could not, so. I think, I think Becky was kind of to share the link in the chat, so if you look in there. Uh, you could press it's a free, on it. It's a free um, link if you, it's all on one page. It has a French introduction. I'm not sure if you guys have the French introduction, but. Yeah, um, that's what we got also. Okay. Yeah, thanks for sharing it. Sure. And, and may, and may, and may, and may, and may, and may, I'm just going to mute everyone uh, so we don't get that echo, but you can unmute when you have questions. You're able yeah, well. To... Okay, there we go. I just want to I just want to give oh gosh Maybe, I'm sorry you gotta, you gotta keep back away. Is someone I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from there we go okay you also have invited oh Richard Yes. You um, spoke so beautifully. It's no good. Hi, Gloria. Let's uh, go straight now. I also want to uh, extend uh, a hearty welcome to a classmate of mine. Uh, Dave, who's, who's joined us, and um, and I'll, I'll def definitely make this uh, very, very interesting and irresistible because there's so much information packed in to this very short, what I call five easy pieces. You remember, go back to the 60s with Jack Nicholson, the great, great movie. So this is, these are five easy pieces that this brilliant writer, Margaret Atwood, put together in order to get a message or many messages across. There are many messages embodied in this piece of bread here, then, so to speak, this uh, this document that I have. There are messages that we've covered in, in the five prior sessions, uh, particularly the idea of encompassing the other, that we are a country that has become so siloized, so fragmented into different groups 
symbolized by um, by a political schism. I won't go that direction, but we know what we're talking about. And so that's a major theme that has been has, has been covered in all five of the sessions that we discussed, uh, including yes, uh, including one that I recently covered, which was the Man to Send Rain Clouds by Leslie Marmon Soko, talking about the uh, unprivileged uh, uh, indigen indigenous tribes in America and how they've been abused. It was a great short story, being able to teach that. So let's begin with Pat Repton. May I? <laughs> I want to say something, but it doesn't, it's not working. Gloria, maybe, maybe type it out and I can read it out loud whenever your yeah. idea. All right. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, so there are five easy takes, five easy pieces on lechem, which is the Hebrew word for bread. You say mochi halachem. Um, and she looks at bread from various angles. And just as she will interpret bread and will come up with some type of final uh, understanding of it's a rather esoteric ending to this short piece, which we will discuss not this week, next week, uh, that we keep in mind that the word bread is used frequently in the five books of Moses. It begins with the phrase when. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. Uh, God declares to them, because they disobeyed his commandment not to eat from the tree of knowledge, they will be forced to, man will be forced to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. So, you know, we begin with the Bible always in the background here. That was the whole purpose of people that are not familiar with uh, Torah would get more familiar with. It. Okay, so let's start off with paragraph one. Do we have a volunteer other than myself, Murray, or Rabbi Kurtz, who would like to read it. Becky, please. All right. Uh, do you want me to read the French or? Oh, uh, no, just the, um, <laughs> unless you know how to, that'd be pretty impressive. I, I do, but I don't, I, I can't translate the whole thing. I could translate part of it. Why not? Can, yeah, go for it. And then you can do the first paragraph also. Okay. <laughs> I, I can okay. translate it. I, Becky, I can translate it. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, sorry, I just have to get it full screen so that it. Okay. All right. Reverie sur un morceau de pain. Um, imagine a piece of bread. Suivant l'état d'esprit, la situation dans laquelle nous nous trouvons, nous réagissons différemment. Do you want to translate okay, that? So, so we have we have reveries. We have. Uh, we have thoughts, reveries, memories about a simple piece of bread. That's what we're talking about. And according to the state of, of, the, of the spirit, okay, the situation in which we find ourselves, okay, we approach it from a different point of view. Okay, we approach yep. it, we attack it. And that's what she's saying. We're looking at a simple piece of bread, which you know is just morsels, just grains of bread. Computer based upon silicon chips, but go ahead. All right, so you want to take the first paragraph? Uh, I didn't read the whole thing. Margaret Atwood oh. imagine certain attitude possible suivant un contexte donné. So I could translate that. She imagines certain um, perspectives, uh, certain possible perspectives towards um, the given situation. Okay. I, I thought that last line was in English in first, and there's a lot of words that look familiar. <laughs> yeah, I, I, are, you reading, are you reading a French translation, a French uh, document? Yes, she knows French. Okay, just the top. Not, yeah, I'm just the top. But, but for the rest of us, that uh, okay. Uh, and, all right. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to read the first paragraph. But wait a second, so that we can all participate. Because we want to. I want to cover at least two or three of these today. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Can I read the first paragraph? Trust me, we can spend an hour on just one of these simple pieces, okay? There's so much to talk about. 
yeah, uh, let me read the first English yeah. paragraph. Okay. Go for the first paragraph. Okay, imagine a piece of bread. You don't have to imagine it. It's right here in the kitchen on the breadboard in its plastic bag lying beside the bread knife. The bread knife is an old one you picked up at an auction. It has the word bread carved into the wooden handle. You open the bag, pull back the wrapper, cut yourself a slice. You put butter on it, then peanut butter, then honey, and you fold it over. Some of the honey runs out onto your fingers and you lick it off. It takes you about a minute to eat the bread. This bread happens to be brown, but there is also white bread in the refrigerator and a heel of the rye you got last week. Round as a full stomach then, now going moldy. Occasionally you make bread. You think of it as something relaxing to do with your hands. Okay, uh, a, a brief comment. I, I'm, then, I'm not gonna analyze it, but keep in mind that the fact that she tells you first to imagine a piece and then she pulls the rug from under you. She says, oh, you don't have to imagine it. She says, come into my own kitchen. I, I've got a surplus bread here. I've got three different types of bread. I even have bread in the little cupboard. My mom used to have one. And, and if you leave it in there more than four or five days, it gets moldy, okay? But there's plenty of food here. It's in abundance. Uh, you, you know, you can smell it, you can touch it. So you don't have to imagine it, okay? So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, there's a lot to discuss here. I just want to create a general picture of where she's taking this simple piece of bread, okay? Do we have a volunteer for the second piece of bread? If uh, if you are volunteering, you could unmute so I could uh, figure out who's interested. Anyone else on the uh, on the Zoom would like to read? All right, I'll take the next are we one. Gonna are we going to discuss the first paragraph? Well, or we, 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 we want to cover, we want to kind of, we're, we're already 20 minutes in. We should really get through the story. I think, just because I've studied this very deeply, I think it makes sense to, for us to pause and build up. It's, an, yeah. it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful yeah. mosaic. So let's just pause. Let's just talk a little bit about the imagery of this first piece, okay? I introduced it. What other thoughts do you people have about what Becky just read? I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking, if I may, uh, of of plentitude that there that uh, I feel that um, I have everything that I could possibly want abundance. Okay. Yes. Anybody else? Excellent. That's exactly what I think she's trying to create. A sense we of just service. take everything for granted, and all all the luxuries we right. have. Gloria, anyway, Gloria, you may have a second device. Do you have two two devices open? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Gloria, you're on two windows, so you have two you devices have two running, open. which means they're going to interfere with each other. Close one of the windows and then you won't have that. How do I close one of the windows? I, if, if you came on, like, are you on on a cell phone as well as on your computer? Yes, or are you on? IPad so turn off one or the other. I could do this manually. I could, I could just pick one of them out of the session and then uh, she won't be on two devices. Uh, do you, Gloria, do you want your iPad or your computer to start? I need. Well, you know, I'll Gloria, take if you mute one of them, you have no problem. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think this worked. Gloria, are you still with us? I'm with you. There you Good. go. You're, you're set now. Thank you. Whatever you did, thank you. No, I just wanted to say when you read about the the bread and how you can eat it and what's on the bread and everything else, um, I think you just people just take the life that they have, the good life, if you may, I say good, um, take it for granted. It's there. You don't have to question it. Most people do not. And uh, you just go on until you get to the second paragraph and then life suddenly makes a 360 turn and it's yes. not necessarily so. You make a great point by saying that take it for granted. That bread in this particular first part is a part of the abundance of life. It's the, it's the it's 
all the pleasures at your fingertips, so to speak. And uh, it's very sensual. She, she, she attracts your sense of eyesight. You, you watch the, the, uh, that antique, uh, yeah, antique uh, knife uh, cut. Uh, means that this person is very well off and can afford to go out and, and, and buy a, uh, an antique uh, bread cutter. And I find and it interesting, if I may interrupt, that bread is what it, we're talking about. I remember growing up as a child, always hearing bread being the staff of life. And here it is, in black and white, she's writing, um, a story or poetry about bread, and bread but, is the staff of life. I do agree, but there is an ambivalence to, to what you're saying. On the one hand, bread without bread, you don't live. Bread and water, that's, that goes without saying. But then on the other hand, uh, so bread is very important. On the other hand, bread in this particular situation, is, you take it for granted. It's, it's a part of your very comfortable, you know, lower Fairfield County mm -hmm. life, living very comfortably here and nothing to worry about because there's an abundance. Bread does not have an, a very important function other than being a part of your very complete environment. You're very complete. Everything is comfortable. Uh, you couldn't have it better from here. One more, one more thing, if I may say, if there's nobody else that wants to contribute. Um, sure. uh, makes me think about the dream in in um, in Brashit of of the um, the baker um, yep. that there's going to be you know uh, what are they birds eating eating the sheaves up or something that there's going to be a famine. Yeah, uh, Phyllis, you are on target. We will get to that. Um, Seven years of, uh, of <laughs> seven years of abundance, and Gloria mentioned that in, in piece number two, it turns three sixty. Yeah, of course. We have the famine. Okay, so we go from a scene of complete comfort, sensory comfort. It's all in the sensory, perceptible, tactile world. There's nothing yeah, all, visual all in this first. It's all. Practical. Mm -hmm. It's a practical uh, picture. You don't have to imagine anything. If you're it also reminds someone. me of making challah. Of what? Of making challah. Yes, yes, yes. We will talk about that. Little There's sentence. So much we can talk about. Yes, absolutely. The, the challah. You know. uh, but the challah is a way of elevating the mundane uh -huh. the Sabbath to the spiritual, which we will come to. That's, that's all hinted here. She's not a, uh, a Judaicist, but she taps on fundamental, universal, religious concepts. So let's go on to uh, number two. Uh, anybody? Hi. Imagine a famine. Now imagine a piece of bread. Both of these things are real, but you happen to be in the same room with only one of them. Put yourself into a different room. That's Sorry, you're frozen. All right. You want to continue reading it? Yeah. Richard, 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 Richard will pick it up, and when Gloria comes back, we'll give her another paragraph. Yes. Okay, Gloria, you're on the right track. We're going to continue when you start. So imagine a famine. Now imagine a piece of bread. Both of these things are real, but you happen to be in the same room with only one of them. Okay? Put yourself into a different room. That's what the mind is for. Imagination. You are now lying on a thin mattress in a hot room. The walls are made of dried earth and your sister, who is younger than you are, is in the room with you. She is starving. Her belly is bloated. Flies land on her eyes. You brush them off with your hand. You have a cloth, too. Filthy, damp, and you press it to her lips and forehead. 
piece of bread is the bread you've been saving for days, it seems. You are hungry as she is, and not yet as weak. How long does this take? When will someone come with more bread? You think of going out to see if you might find something that could be eaten, but outside in the streets are infested with scavengers and the stink of corpses is everywhere. Should you share the bread or give the whole piece to your sister? Should you eat the piece of bread yourself? After all, you have a better chance of living. You're stronger. How long does it take to decide? Okay, I'll, I'll make a brief comment because I know <laughs> you all are, are, are drawn by the stark contrast between piece number one and piece number two. And it took me a while of reading this a few times. She does it for a purpose. She does it for, she wants to shock you into the reality of the world that there are millions, so many, I mean, a comment, some comment that 63% of the people in America are go to go to bed where they are fully satisfied, something like that. But more than almost 40% of the people in America go to sleep and they're hungry. I mean, this is a. Um, I'm a thinking shock. worse than that. And it's even it's even more worldwide. It's even more so when you consider Africa, because uh, yeah. this, this scene made me think of, um, of, of, of movies that were made deep in Africa. Uh, yeah. Kurtz, Kurtz being the, uh, he runs the mine for the Congo company in, in the heart of Africa. Um, How about the show off? No, I think, of, no, they're not apocalypse now. That's Another exactly one. what I was going to say, Phyllis. I, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm jumping in, but the I just raised my hand for like- yeah, right my shirt's <laughs> cut, a heart of darkness. <laughs> You know, you 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 got bloated bellies. It's it's almost I see malaria. I'm surrounded by malaria. I'm surrounded by disease. Surrounded by hunger. Flies, flies on her lips. Yes. And the um, flaw, she wants to give comfort to her sister, but she can't because even the cloth is just so polluted. You know, you're talking about pollution here. You're talking about. Okay. Um, can I, sorry, can I jump in with a comment? And uh, Phyllis was saying the same. Uh, you know, this makes me think of my my grandmother's stories from the Holocaust. Uh, how when she was there with her with her crust of bread. I'm sorry, I'm very emotional. That she would share with her cousin, who was very weak, and my grandmother would give her bread to her cousin, and they both survived. Wow. Yes. Yeah, um, that's not theoretical. A lot of us have no this no is people a, actually experience this. This is a very real scene. And of course, this is a German fairy tale. Well, no, that comes on. Uh, don't jump, don't jump, <laughs> don't jump. We're done. We'd be happy to get there in, in, a, in a short while. But let me hear your feedback here. I mean, what was your, I'm telling you, it took me probably two or three readings to kind of get the gist of where she's taking me from a world of comfort to this stark uh, reality of Holocaust, uh, if you will. Um, I think I think it's, you know, it's something that we don't need to talk about America versus Africa. You even think, I mean, literally you could look in a place like Stanford and you see the disparity of, uh, of wealth and living conditions. You know, you go from the shul, you go 10 minutes up north and, uh, you know, everyone's pretty, no one's going to bed hungry there. Everyone is beyond financially stable. And you go five minutes south of where we are and uh, it, it's a complete disparity. It's, uh, it's like the antithesis. So you don't even need to go to Africa. I don't think people are necessarily starving, hopefully with flies in their mouth, but, you know, you can see real disparity in terms of financial food, food insecurity. Yeah, but this is the other end of the this is like the other end of the world. Not even a half hour from us has a um, a, a soup kitchen. Uh, it has a um, it has about fifty to seventy five homeless people that have lived in Westport and lost it all, and they gather uh, at night. They have a 
a collation at night before they go to bed in the morning. They're, they're asked to leave the shelter at eight o'clock and try to get back into the real world. So you don't have to go very far. Uh, you know, the, we in Stanford have a homeless shelter too. And the synagogue does a lot of loving kindness around Christmas time. We, we make uh, turkeys for them and, uh, and, and all the goodings, the stuffing, we bring it over. We have a food pantry. Uh, you, don't, you don't see it on the video, but we have a JFS food pantry donation box right here. Yeah, Shok, the Shok uh, uh, Jewish Family Services, which covers uh, Fairfield County, uh, distributes hundreds. And also I'm a member of the Jewish Family Service of Greenwich from Activist. They, they have taken in hundreds of Afghanistan refugees reaching out to people to take them into their homes to give them a fresh start. So there is a lot of disparity in our community. There is a lot and a lot is being done and not enough publicity is being given. I wrote a piece on my, on my website about what's being done in Westport to get these people rehabilitated because you can't imagine what it's like going from being uh, running a, a big company at Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers. And many of their corporate executives live in Greenwich. And they went from being at the top of the heap to nothing, to nothing. And many of these guys were, they saw their stock plummet to zero. And they were basically putting their hands out to their friends. So it's a, it's a shameful piece that you, we have a contrast between such abundance wealth in our community, in America, tremendous wealth. And we have so many people that are on the starving end of life. And I think that's what she is saying. I call attention to you this cloth, this cloth image, because it will become important uh, later in this on the fifth piece. But uh, just keep it hanging in your mind for a little bit. We um, see who's, uh, who's available on here to read the next one. Uh, yeah, are we right next one? Yeah. Okay. Gloria, do you wanna are you are you back with us? Do you wanna try again? Or, yeah, I'm uh, no, I'm, I have oh. I have optimum coming this afternoon. Maybe I'll get down to the problem. All right, well we hear you clear now. So why don't you try the third paragraph on the bottom of the first column and hopefully uh, your computer will behave long enough to I get through. To one other thing that no one else has to comment that this woman is faced with the choice of a sibling. Do I feed myself first because I'm stronger or do I take care of a poor sibling that is bloated with on the eve of death uh, here? I mean, that's a choice that you sometimes have to make in life. You know? who, do you, who do you give the, the wealth to? Who do you, who do you help? Well, I mean, this, we is a, say, this is a classic debate in the uh, right before Gloria goes. I mean, this is a classic debate in the Gemara about. Yeah. I mean, Richard, we were talking about this before the session about two people walking through the wilderness, and uh, you have enough food to get yourself through it. But if you don't give any to the your companion, he'll for sure die. Do you give some of your bread to the companion that's with you on the chance that both of you will survive, or do you take Keep your bread for yourself. You'll for sure survive, but you know for certain your companion won't. And uh, you know, while it may sound like a theoretical case in the Gemara, I appreciate Becky uh, that you were willing to share with us some of your family history because during times like the Holocaust and other challenging eras of history, uh, these were unfortunately not abstract questions. But and I'm sure she's the author is getting it from there as well. Like these are real, real issues that people have had to face. We have, we have, we have number of doctors in our community. We're very fortunate to have a pediatric neurologist here with us that practiced medicine for many years uh, in Manhattan and Sinai Hospital. I come from a family of doctors. My father was a emeritus professor. He's an outstanding teacher as well as a practitioner of medicine. And my good friend Dave practiced medicine as well for many, many years, went to Columbia PNS. And uh, as, that's where my brother gave one too. But I want to call attention to the fact that I just read an article in the New York Times about a group of healthcare givers from a hospital here in America that are out on strike. Why are they on strike? They are on strike. They will, will not go 
to work with him. You go on. I got it. Okay, the boards at that hospital are just so congested with patients that are suffering from the virus that they cannot deal with triage patients. They can't deal with other emergency situations. And so they are like Rabbi Kurt said, they're stuck, who do I help? And I'm reading stories about doctors. Doctors is the highest suicide rate in the United States of any professional group because they are dealing with life and death situations 24 seven. And the question is, do I save myself? Do I save, which patient should I take care of? I'm looking at patients that half of them may, probably will die in the next 30 days on the wards. But I've got people on, in ambulances on the street that are begging to come in and they can't help them. So there's a crisis in, and they went out on strike. And this is real. This is what's happening here. And not only at that hospital, Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, where this it was, the, uh, it was the center of the virus here in New York City, they, they, they masses of corpses in ambulances outside of the hospital because they couldn't accommodate any more dead people. That's, that was the reality. Reality sucks, guys. And that's what this paragraph is. And, and it's so concurrent with what's happening here in America in our own community. Yeah, we'll get as far as we can. I mean, I'm getting, uh, I told my, uh, my associate and colleague here in, in spiritual as well as uh, uh, literary, this is a rabbi that has such a strong passion for literary as he does for traditional uh, Judaic texts. Uh, it's beautiful to work with him. Um, I told him, I said, we will not get through this. Uh, we won't get through, we're gonna have to come back. I, I told, I, you know, there's too much here to discuss this. That, you know, I wanna show you guys that not that we have to come back next month or whatever, but that there's so much here that relates to what's going on in our, and she wrote this years ago. She didn't, this is, this is a classic piece of literature that's being taught in hundreds of classrooms across the United States. That's the way I found out about it. So how do you decide? You're a doctor at this hospital. If I, if I don't take the patient out there in the, that's in the ambulance wanting to come, he'll die. If I, if I, if I bring him in, I've got to take somebody else out here and send them to their death. So these are real life and death questions that is tormenting the medical industry. This is one of the, 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 the avenues that my career is, is taking me to, to go to my website. I'm re rewriting it completely, but uh, uh, something must be done to alleviate the medical pressures that are building up as a result of this uh, coronavirus. It's bringing a lot of reality to the table and you can't run from it. You can't run, you gotta deal with it. And, uh, and that's part of, you know, part of my medical training. I went to medical school for a number of years and decided that I wanted to pursue the liberal arts career, which has taken me far, far afield. But let's continue. Anybody else have any more comment? Before yeah, talking, talking yeah. about doctors, I would just like to add this as an aside. Doctors are being overtaxed and they just can't handle what's going on. And because of that, uh, doctors are retiring early and yes. more so young people, many young people who would, who thought about going into the medical field are choosing something else. And this is what I hear from the doctors in my family. Yes, yes, um, without a doubt. I mean, the medical profession is in a crisis right now. Uh, you've got a couple of medical schools that have, uh, like NYU funds your four year, $400,000 um, career completely. And Columbia PNS does to a great degree. It funds those who have to show a scholarship need at Columbia, whereas at NYU you don't. So, uh, but the problem is that they cannot find enough people to become general practitioners to take care of the needy, the poor, the sick. They want to go into the more glamour professions. You can't blame them. I mean, they put, a, they put in their 14, 15 years 
of study. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars getting up to the seven figures, getting to where they are, and they want to have a payback of sorts. So it's a crisis in many respects. Thank you for sharing that with us, um, Gloria. Okay. Um, um, I, uh, can I just say <laughs> two, two words that uh, I am, you know, made me think of this paragraph, Uvacharta Bachayim. Yep. Choose life. Yes. You have to choose that's, life. You know? Well, the issue is the, the people in this situation don't exactly have a choice. That's the, uh, or, they, or they have a very bad set of choices. But, but, but I'm saying if you have, uh, if you're in a situation, um, that's what comes up. If you, if you, if you have a choice to, to share or not to share, you have to think about Whose life do you say? Sophie's Choice, a classic movie. Um, <laughs> that's a different choice, yeah. In many different directions. Uh, different. Can, can I add one thing? Um, regarding the situation in the hospitals and caring for people who are ill, when politicians make rules and regulations, uh, it doesn't help the patient and it puts the doctor under great stress. They can't make what they feel is proper for the patient. The politicians do. I have this in New York State and it's disgusting. Uh, you know, it's all political, all things. Equipment of medical equipment across the board. Hospitals do not have enough ventilators. They don't have enough MRI machines. Uh, it's a crisis and you can't shove it under the carpet anymore. It's screaming to be, to be addressed. It really is and I agree with you. I agree that profession is under tremendous stress right now. Where it will end up is... May I just uh, make one comment? I don't know if you're all aware of it, but you can get four uh, testing um, kits and the post office will send it to you. One, um, one for uh, package to each household. And it's a free um, situation. All you have to do is fill out a form online, send it in, and you will uh, receive you. this uh, four, four of these eventually. So really if you don't you. know, uh, if you haven't heard about it or haven't read about it, look into it. Not that, they're, not that they're so great, and sometimes they give a wrong reading, but it's better than nothing. Yep. Very good. Very Thank good. you. Yeah, now let's go on to number three. Do we have a reader for paragraph number three? Anyone volunteering on the computer? I will pass Ooh, because I'm afraid I'll good. lose you eventually. Chair. Sure. I don't know if she has the sheet right there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks, for uh, thanks for sharing the link, Becky. Now we got to hire you for technical support. Um, Okay, you know what? I'll I'll read the next paragraph in the meantime. How about and then someone else can volunteer for the following one. Imagine a prison. There is something you know that you have not yet told. There is there those in control of the prison know that you know. So do those not in control. If you tell thirty or forty or a hundred of your friends, your comrades will be caught and will die. If you refuse to tell, tonight will be like last night. They always choose the night. Don't think about the night, however, but about the piece of bread they offer you. How long does it take? The piece of bread was brown and fresh and reminded you of sunlight falling across a wooden floor. It reminded you of a bowl, a yellow bowl, that was once in your home. It held apples and pears. It stood on a table you can also remember. It's not the hunger or the pain that is killing you, but the absence of the yellow bowl. You can only hold the bowl in your hands. Right here, you can withstand anything you tell yourself. The bread they offer you is subversive. It's treacherous. It does not I, I, I want to expand on a comment that Becky made that 
you know, if you just have that one piece of bread, but if you have such a strong imagination that, and it does start, imagine a prison. You're in, you're in a Holocaust situation and you have this one piece of bread, but you have an image of this bowl, what it was like back in paragraph in piece number one, everything was rosy, hunky-dory, and abundant. So you, a lot of your ability to survive depends on your imagination, your ability to take what is simple and mundane and create a world of abundance, which is what a lot of us don't do. We, we, you know, we take so much that we have for granted and we don't really think of those that don't have and how to make life better for them. We have the abundance and what about other people? And what about this man is, has knowledge that the prison, the, the prison warden wants to know that. And this, this knowledge may impinge on the life of the other prisoner. So if he divulges this secret that he has, he could imperil the life of 30 or 40 of his prison mates. So, and they're trying to control him. They're trying to weasel out of him by cruelly withholding what happens at night, every night. Somebody tell me, what, what, what's happening at night? Why is night important here? Other than Eli Wiesel speaks about night in his, in his famous book. But what is it about night? What, why is this reader so concerned about night? They always choose the night. These people that Maybe want to control. They take away his sleep. They beat, beat him up. That's possible. I, I'll, take it, I, I'll take it further that the morsel of bread that he gets, he would get it at night if he speaks, if he tells them what they want to hear. So I think I think if they, they are planning an escape, and that's the that's what it is that they want to know. That's very good. I mean, you're using your imagination in a beautiful way. I love that. Uh, yes, exactly. They could be planning an escape, the great escape, which I just saw again, uh, maybe 50 years ago. Uh, yes, and he they know that he knows something. Uh, but they don't know what it is, okay? And those around him know, know that secret. And they, of course, don't want him to tell it because that would get them all into trouble and they potentially lose their life. So night, night contrasts with the, the daylight. He imagines this bowl, okay, yellow bowl that was once in the sun, and it has sun falling across this wooden floor. Night is the absence of light. And night is scary, it's, it's empty. And that possibly would be the time that he would be fed at night. And he fears the night because it's another night of going hungry. And the only thing to keep him going, or her going, is to imagine at one time, I was living in Westport, Connecticut, and I had this beautiful eight bedroom home outdoor swimming pool, indoor tennis court, whatever. Uh, and I no longer have it. And I'm stuck here in a, in a, in a shelter. That's a lot of many people across the United States that the United World. So um, what I think he, he is hinting at here is the control that those who have the power exercise over those who are powerless. And this can be extrapolated in many, many different, I'm not taking it to the politics. I don't want to get into politics, although that's on everybody's mind. But you know, that's in a situation where you, we've all been in situations where we have okay? um, control. Oh, at night fears are magnified. So maybe the captives feel that's when a person is most vulnerable. Correct. The fears of man and uh, worries, exactly. Night intruders. Uh, we say the prayers in uh, Shulchan Aruch speaks about 
special prayers that we say at night to ward off the demons. In, in the literature, there was a sphere of demons, night, you know, we don't believe in Satan, but we do believe in, in some type of evil spirits that are out there, and, uh, evil eye and whatever. Uh, so night is very, very perilous. Night is scary. And yet you've got this man who's being controlled by Big Brother, if you will. That, that's a perfect illustration. 1984, Big Brother. We have very little, and I, you know, I have... I told uh, Rabbi Kurtz about a situation in my life where, you know, I, I was controlled to a great degree by, by my parents, what they wanted, the profession that I was supposed to be in. And, uh, and, and, and it's very scary. And I shared this with one of the members. I won't mention who I've shared it with one of the members I'm here tonight, today. Uh, but people have, they use all kinds of authority to control your destiny. And luckily, I had the strength and the will to cut out on my own what I'm supposed to be doing in life. But if I told you what had been done to me holding out my future, kind of scary, kind of scary. But, um, and it happened, it's happened again in my life. But, you know, we, we all have uh, impediments, blocks that we have to overcome. Um, we go through mourning periods and you're controlled by mourning. There's very little that, that Judaism mandates that you refrain from pleasures and, and refrain from thinking of yourself and thinking about those that you've lost. So, you know, there are temporary controls that are exercised on people that I'm not even aware of uh, in, in our religion. Uh, any other comments about this? We might, we might make it through four and depending upon your schedule and make it through five or five. I, I'm determined to keep it under an hour. Murray, Murray is uh, our doctor here, our resident doctor. He's a uh, resident doctor can stay. So uh, I, need to, I need to go at 11. What? Okay. I on my phone. So okay. All right. So Rabbi Kurtz has to do So we have. We have time to introduce five easy pieces. And these pieces get, trust me, hard. I would say five harder pieces. These get harder to interpret until the last one, which I think is brilliant. Uh, we'll get there next week, uh, next time. We'll start off next time completing it. And I do have a surprise. Um, one of our own members of the tribe won the Nobel Prize in Literature five years ago. Who would that be? Somebody, member of our tribe, Bob, Bob, Zimmer, Bob Dylan uh, won the Nobel Prize in Literature because he is a great, great writer of poetry, great writer of verse, he's a great folklorist, and he happens to, he davens at the Chabad Synagogue off of Fairfax in LA from a friend of mine who also goes there. So he's very connected to us even though he went through his Christian phase. So next we, next time we will have an introduction to Bob Dylan, but um, we have four minutes. We have, an, we have a volunteer. Has anyone not been able to read it? I would like to read the next paragraph. <clears throat> I don't mind reading if you want somebody yeah, to read. Is that, is that Phyllis? Yeah. Phyllis. Yeah, Phyllis, please take us away. There were once two sisters. One was rich and had no children. The other had five children and was a widow. So poor that she no longer had any food left. She went to her sister and asked her for a mouthful of bread. My children are dying, she said. The rich sister said, I do not have enough for myself and drove her away from the door. Then the husband of the rich sister came home and wanted to cut himself a piece of bread. But when he made the first cut, out flowed red blood. Everyone knew what that meant. This is a traditional German fairy tale. Thank That's you, folks. Crazy. Tell us, you introduced it. Do you have any comments that you'd like to get us started in the last three minutes before Rabbi Kurtz had to leave? 
Any comments to introduce? Well, you know, to me, it says that the, the, the rich sister was responsible for the for the uh, impending death of her uh, sister and family. And uh, yeah. I would say I would say that's almost the prashat, you know, the uh, you know the, the simple reading of it is that she doesn't feed the sister with five children, the children will certainly die. I mean, they're more precarious than she is, but you know, you're right, that, that death will follow what she has said and what she will not do. Exactly. Any other comment? Blood equals life and effect. And in effect, uh, she's uh, causing the death of her sister and the children. Uh, okay, I think you're echoing again, but I think we caught, did, we, did you catch that? Uh, I saw you catch it. I did, it came back. Yeah. All right. All right. Gloria, Gloria, your equipment needs to be diagnosed. Yeah. Yes, I'm. Okay, you know, let's, why don't we just wrap this up? Yeah, uh, Gloria, I, I just want one last thought here is that I chuckle and she says, she says to uh, her starving younger sister, I do not have enough for myself. How often have we heard that when we go out and request donations from people that can pave America and they basically say, I, I can't feed my own family. I don't have enough for myself. I thought that was an aside that uh, Margaret Atwood had to slip in there. Okay, I wanna thank everybody for coming and, and, and reigniting the interest that we have in, in literature and Torah uh, and uh, and keep this going. My purpose is I'll keep finding short pieces. This is called flash fiction. Bob Dylan will be flash fiction. So Simon and Garfunkel potentially, yeah, flash fiction. So we have a lot, lot of literature and poetry and uh, Torah wisdom to discuss. And I thank everybody for coming. And above all, stay well. Yeah, definitely. Also, just like on a, on a technical note, um, uh, to make it more comfortable for people in person, next time we meet, we could see about maybe meeting in the Simcha room where we can, you know, people could distance throughout the entire room, uh, like 30 feet apart. And uh, if that's of interest, if that's like what would make people comfortable to meet in person, I'm definitely open to exploring it because uh, we're doing our best with the Zoom. Uh, but, you know, Obviously, nothing beats the good old hard copies. So and you I could have, let us know. And I have a postscript that since you mentioned the Simcha Room, please, our heartfelt prayers for Simcha Rubin, who is obviously urgently needs our prayers. But we have two members of our synagogue uh, that have survived up to three to four months at Stanford Hospital, three to four months. Uh, and they have come back to the living and they're doing very well. So yeah. keep Simcha Rubin's Hebrew name in mind, Simcha Gamliel Ben Sara, keep him in mind. So hopefully he will get better. Now. All right. All right. Thank you everyone for uh, choosing to spend your morning with us and looking forward. We'll be in touch about next month. Take care, everyone.